uh, I am Ioannis Binetoglu, uh, as Mihai said, I work for the Clean Air Task Force, which is an advocacy group uh, that has a long history in working with uh, methane and methane mitigation, promoting uh, regulations in this uh, respect. And I'm going to talk to you about what is our view about the role of satellites and remote sensing in reducing oil and gas methane emissions. Um, uh, and ju just to, to give you the overview from, from, from the beginning, uh, we believe that satellites are a game changer for methane monitoring. And, and this is for, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, they make the problem that we have visible in the sense because they, they, they monitor the entire globe with similar instruments every day. Uh, they cannot let anybody deny that the problem exists. So. Uh, many countries or many companies could either deny the problem or they could just simply do not know the problem. But in the recent years, with remote sensing from planes and from satellites, this is changed. It is no, 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 no longer possible. Um, as a second step, they also make the problem quantitative. So we just know that we, we just don't know that there is there are emissions, uh, but we also know how how much these emissions are, even maybe not with the detail. That OGMP will do it, but we know that there is globally, uh, we know how much of the emissions are. And, and this allows us to set targets and also develop appropriate policies. For example, if a country wants to reduce its emissions by 30%, but doesn't know where it starts or doesn't know where it has to go, then there is no much sense in this. So the satellites will give us the quantitative way to moving forward. Um, also, an interesting thing about satellites is that because they have, we have many satellites and many technologies, we can monitor both methane emissions directly and also flaring. So it, they give us a very nice way to, mo to monitor the complete uh, oil and gas industry. And then and what you will hear in the, in the following and what we will hear in general is that, okay, satellites have achieved a tremendous thing the last three years, but the real excitement is about the up 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 upcoming capabilities because we're expecting a lot of new satellites coming in the next uh, in the next few few years. Um, so just to start, before I, I will show you, I'll try today to show you some examples of what satellites can do already, and then uh, give you some more details. But just so you have a, a sense that what we are talking about remote sensing instruments on satellites, they're not something extremely complicated. You can have a very good intuition about them because they are just advanced cameras on spaceships. They look a lot like the cameras we know we have on phones or the normal cameras, but with some differences, of course. So instead of just detecting uh, three colors, like red, green, and blue, like the cameras we have to, they have multiple, they detect multiple colors or multiple bands, actually, because they're not only colors, they are both in the ultraviolet and the infrared. And through all this information they have, they can extract extra information, like the methane concentration, for example. And also, while our cameras usually have, you can zoom in, zoom out, and see more detail or more broadly, uh, satellites usually cannot do that. Uh, they, but the designer of the instrument has to choose either to have a very large field of view, so they let's say, zoom out and they see a lot of part of the globe each day, but not with very much detail. Or some uh, instrument manufacturers decide that they, they would have an instrument that always zoom in a lot in some details, so you can see with very much detail, but a very small part of the, of the globe or of the industry. So there are these very two very broad categories that I will discuss also later on. And also one similarity with cameras is that remote sensing, they do not always work. Uh, they obviously need light, and so they work during daytime, most of, most of the instruments. And so during nighttime, we don't have much information of what is going on. Also, there are clouds, which is an important limitation, because as the, the satellites fly over an area, if there are clouds, they cannot see through them, at least the methane uh, uh, satellites. And sometimes they can also be confused by a very complicated background. They work better if the land, which is the background of the methane, it works, uh, it is quite, let's say, uniform. So now I will, I will see, show you some examples and some details more about flaring and methane. And I will start with flaring because flaring is much simpler from a remote sensing, sensing perspective. So, and this is because combustion sources like fires are very easy to detect from space during night because everything is dark in the fires very easily uh, distinguished from the background. Uh, and especially flares, because they usually burn at very high temperatures, like more than 1,000 degrees, 1,400 degrees, uh, they can very be easily be distinguished from other processes like forest fires. So we can have a very confident uh, identification and detection of flares throughout the globe. Uh, and another thing that simplifies our discussion and you are, as, as users of this data is that 
virtually all the data we have now come from a single satellite instrument, uh, uh, which is called VIRS. If you work with Claire, you will hear a lot of, of this name. So if we look a little at this satellite a little bit more, uh, so VIRS, which is a, a complex acronym, acronym of visible infrared image and radiometric suite, because it can do, do many things apart from this, is was built from NASA and NOAA. It's a joint uh, instrument. And they're the same instrument, two similar instruments are on two satellites, the one launched at 2011 and one 2017, and maybe more will come. Um, these rotate around the globe several, several times per day, and they can overpass the same uh, place several times a day, day and detect flares. Uh, they are very sensitive to flares because flares are so obvious. As we said, they can even detect flares which are smaller than one square meter. Uh, and this can easily be detected, and all the data they have are for free. Uh, such satellites, for example, can be used to, to monitor what, what is the situation, monitor implementation uh, of policies, and can also quantify the progress towards goals. So even with this satellite, even with this data set, we see all the steps that I discussed before of what is the role of satellites. And just as you get a, a visual overview of this tremendous power that this satellite gives us, this is a, a measurement practically from one day, um, showing flare locations throughout the, throughout the Earth. Uh, and so what you can see, first of all, you can see, the, as I discussed before, you can see the problem very easily. You can see all the major flaring locations in the US, Russia, in Northern Europe, in Nigeria, in other places. Uh, so first of all, it can set the discussion and the current state that we cannot deny that flaring is a widespread practice. Second, in this, we, from this data, as we have this every day and for free, uh, we can very easily quantify how flaring is, uh, is, what is the quantitative state of flaring. And as more pro, uh, policies are implemented, we can monitor our progress day to day towards this target. So with this data set, we can exploit really uh, all this information or in, in, in actually mitigating the, the impact of oil and gas industry. Um, so on the second step, we have methane detection, uh, which here the situation is much more complicated. Um, so some, some very in initial remarks. Uh, first of all, satellite instruments cannot detect methane uh, emissions, but they only detect methane concentration. Uh, actually, they can see how much methane is, uh, is below them, but they cannot see the leak rate. Or if, if this is, uh, if, yeah, if there's a big emission or a small emission, that just the methane uh, remains there. So it is possible to calculate emissions, and satellites are used for this, but we also need ancillary information, like mainly wind data, to see how much the methane is dispersing. Um, there are currently uh, several methane sensing instruments on space and in orbit. Uh, some of them are from uh, big uh, space agencies like ESA, which is the European Space Agency, and JAXA, which is the Japanese Space Agency. But there is also a private company, GHGSAT, that provides methane measurements uh, for, you know, for pro pro profit basis. And this actually hints to a new business model that we will see more in the next years. And as I said, as I said, there is a lot of excitement about the new capabilities that will come very soon. For example, there is this carbon mapper uh, instrument, the carbon mapper constellation of instruments, actually, which comes in a, which is a spin off from NASA, and they have also a non and a non profit and a for profit branch. So we will have a lot of free data from them uh, globally. And also, there is this very notable methane sat from the Environmental Defense Fund, and a very large non profit in the US. And so these satellites, which we are expecting in the next, in the next couple of years, will really move us forward. Um, and so when you are thinking about methane observations from space, you should just, there are two very broad categories. On the top, uh, on the top, these, these instruments there uh, are what we call the area mappers. So these are the instruments that I talked before that have zoom out and they can see a lot of the Earth, but not with great uh, detail of what is going on. Um, so, for example, the first two instruments, those at Entropome, are already flying and making a real impact of our knowledge, but there are a lot of, lot of other instruments that will come in the next years. Uh, and these will allow us to quantify emissions uh, at, the, let's say, continental, uh, regional, or national scale. Uh, but there are also a lot of instruments that currently can be in the zoom in category, the point source imagers that can tell you, tell you the facility level. Uh, if a specific facility is emitting uh, a lot of uh, a lot of methane or not, 
Um, you can see notably here the GLG SAT, which is an instrument just for methane, but a lot of the other instruments uh, were built for different purposes, but scientists discovered that they can use them in with smart ways to also detect methane. So this gives us a very big arsenal of global data sets to detect methane leaks. Uh, and I will focus just on two of them, Tropomi, which is up here, and GHG SAT, just to give you an insight of what these instruments can, can give. And if you are working on methane, you will hear these names quite a lot. So Tropomi is a European satellite, part of the uh, part of the huge Copernicus program, the U European du Union. And what we can actually do, it comes daily above the complete Earth and monitors methane, methane for the state of methane globally every day, but with a relative coarse uh, resolution. So we cannot really see real facilities, but it, it's pixel in the image. It's, let's say, more or less five to by three kilometers. So we can see. Uh, bigger trends and bigger bigger changes. Uh, so, so what we use actually tropomics is very useful because we can estimate emissions at regional, national, and continental scale, as I said before. And sometimes, if an emission is huge, like what we call ultra emitters, then they can even detect some huge plumes, which unfortunately were a couple per day uh, globally. And also, they can be used to validate bottom-up emission inventories and bottom-up emission estimates. So they have a play a very crucial role. Uh, in methane mitigation. Um, just as an, an example, on the left, we see a, a map of the United States based on data from two months. Um, you can see the methane concentration above the US. And if you notice on the bottom of this uh, purple box, which is the, it's the border between uh, New, uh, New Mexico and Texas, which is the Permian Valley, one of the most uh, oil and gas producing region in the States, you can see a lot of red, which means a lot of emissions in, in these uh, areas. So we know that we can already know that there is a problem there. And the second step, which is, on, uh, which is also very interesting on the right, um, is we can use this, uh, as I said, these uh, measurements to try to estimate the emissions. Uh, on, on the left side, it's what our inventories told us. Uh, uh, so what, they, what was our best knowledge before the satellite came, and you can see not too many emissions, but then through modeling and simulations, we can see what should be, what are the emissions to be compatible with what the satellite measures. And you can see that there is a, there, after this procedure, we understand that our inventory is not appropriate and there are a lot of things to be uh, improved and increased. Um, so again, we see the same procedure first, that they make satellites will make the problem visible at a global scale, and then they can also be used to quantify and set targets and policies. Uh, and then a very interesting complement to this is the GHG SAT, which I said is a private company based on Canada. They can currently have two or three satellites in orbit, but many more will come. They plan to have 10 satellites within the next years. Uh, so they can see, they can cover a lot of detail around the globe. Um, and, and the difference is that these are very zoomed in in some detail, so they can see at 25 by 25 meter uh, resolution, uh, which means they can actually see facilities uh, in very in, in big detail and detect plumes, and I'll also be able to pinpoint where the plume is coming from. And this is important because this can die, uh, this can guide uh, leak detection and repair activity on the ground. So when the satellite sees something, it can really guide where the ground crew should go and try to to pinpoint the source of the emission and fix it. Um, the sensitivity is much better, so it can take super emitters, but not the really, the really small leaks, which you cannot see from space. And again, to see just to get an idea of how these two satellites compare, on the left, we have again data from Tropomi, the previous satellite, uh, which you can see some uh, two images as a comparison between what were the emissions in 2019 and what happened in 2020. And you can see a huge increase in 2020 uh, I'm not sure why this happens. They, they said that probably because due to COVID, there was a lot of gas that nobody needed, so it was just released in the atmosphere. Uh, but I don't know if this is true. But just for the comparison, uh, the images on the right are, are just from GSAT. So if you see this, we zoom in this very small area, which is this big rectangle, and then we can even zoom at, at really uh, the facility level and see where the plume is. But one of the plumes, there are many plumes there, but one of the plumes we can really see where it is and where it comes from. So we, from this information, uh, the operator of this asset can really go and fix it and, and repair it. Um, and just to know, this is from the first demonstration satellite of GHG. Their current capabilities are even much, much better. 
Uh, and this is all. The, this will, we will see more of this data from the new uh, uh, point uh, point imagers like uh, carbon mapper. So after this, now, now that you know all this, I will just tell you what I think or we think that's the role of satellites in the methane mitigation. And as we saw, they can provide frequent and global coverage uh, of both flaring and large, large methane emissions. Uh, and in this way, they will increase transparency of global emissions. So everybody will know what is the state of emissions more or less globally, and those that are doing progress will can take appropriate credit. So it also creates motivation. And moreover, as a further step, they can also support target setting and, and policy making. Um, they can also monitor the effectiveness of these policies, and even they can support certification processes so that we know that, for example, if the European Union is importing gas from a region, we can see if they are flaring, and if we could also try to push through the import the buying power, uh, maybe. I mean, this is another thing that satellites uh, permit such, such way of thinking. But there are some caveats. Uh, first of all, there is ex we need extended validation because as we have more data sets, we need to be sure what is the precision of each one and, and each time we use a, set, a data set, we need to be sure it is fit for the purpose we are using it. Uh, then, because uh, it's very complicated to follow all these uh, satellites, we need independent and trusted entities to integrate the data, and this is exactly the role of IMEO, so we really support this um, pro procedure uh, of IMEO as an integrator of data. And finally, we should remember in all this excitement that exists now that the satellites are not a silver bullet. They will not solve all our problems, but these are just a part of a wider methane monitoring system. And, uh, and they can only be part of a wider filter protocol because the real change happens on the ground when the end engineer goes and picks something. So we need this to think a system, to think a system of systems where a satellite is just a small part of it. And so this is all. Thank you for your attention.